Hi, I'm Callum and I'm one of the F2 doctors at Glancluid and my modest project has been on reducing the amount of blood tests we do in intensive care uh, and hopefully by the end of this you'll you'll understand what you're seeing there uh, just underneath in the tomorrow's blood document. Righty ho, so uh, we're going to go through the basics really, uh, why we're doing it, what exactly we've done, uh, some initial results uh, from some audit that we've done uh, and, and how we're planning on keeping on working on this. So it hopefully fairly obvious to everyone listening that the intensive care supports some, some really sick patients. Uh, and along with that, they need fairly close monitoring. Part of that is that we do really frequent blood tests. Now, on one hand, that's absolutely essential for, for not only diagnosis, but monitoring and altering our therapy. But it's also really costly um, time consuming and uh, indeed is associated with some harms. Now, looking into the evidence around the harm of increasing phlebotomy, which is to say the practice of taking blood, taking increasing amounts of blood, uh, the first outcome that might be of no surprise to anyone is that the more blood you take, uh, the greater amount of anemia that you see in your patients. Um, but also surprisingly, it's associated with some rather more dramatic outcomes, such as inpatient mortality and length of stay even when you adjust for how sick these patients are relative to one another. Now, there are also some other factors to consider, uh, the medical resource side of things, obviously the laboratory and the intensive care, both, it both cost them money and staff time. Uh, and also critically, uh, the more anemic patients you have in your department, the more blood transfusions you're going to need to give. And that's really a resource that we should be trying to, to protect as, as much as possible. And while it's slightly less relevant perhaps to, to your sedated intensive care patient, the complications of venipuncture themselves can be quite unpleasant. Bruising and pain are, are not uncommon. And indeed the symptoms of anemia uh, in the context of someone that's already critically unwell uh, could be quite unpleasant. And there are some references there for anyone that wants to, to read into this a little bit further. So I've told you all about how taking blood is a bad thing to do. So how do we do less of it? Uh, and I think there are two potential approaches here. The first is to reduce the amount of lab tests that we order and thereby we, we take less blood. I think in most cases that requires fairly careful consideration because in most cases you're taking blood for a reason, but our intensive care unit was a, was a good target for this and, and I'll explain a little bit more about why that was a, an easy mark later. Uh, and the second strategy is, is volume reduction, take less blood when you do need to take it. Uh, now, on the right there, you'll see an example of a blood conservation device. Uh, now, that is designed to reduce any wasted blood when you draw blood from an arterial line, which is what we do in intensive care. The other option is to use smaller blood bottles, uh, spend, send less blood to the lab, take less blood from the patient. However, both of these methods come with an associated cost. We don't stock these items as, as standard, and we can replicate many of their impacts with the existing equipment that we have. And therefore, they're something that we looked into, but haven't really formed a, a major part of, of our intervention. And indeed, they've never become very popular in, in intensive care practice. There are a few references here for anyone that's more interested, but there isn't a great deal more out there because they've never gained widespread accept, uh, acceptance. OK, uh, so talking about what we do at Glancluid then before I started this work, uh, every day, every patient had blood drawn. 11 individual orders were made covering four bottles of blood. Uh, and then we do additional blood gases throughout the day uh, to monitor their progress. And six to eight times a day as a guide for a fairly sick patient, it could be far more, but it can also be less. Uh, and all the formal blood tests that we send off to the lab that we take in the morning uh, are, are reviewed at the morning ward round by, by the medical staff. Now, given what I've just told you, there are some fairly obvious problems here. Uh, the first being that uh, with standardised blood testing comes redundant blood testing, uh, representing risk to our patient without any benefit if we're not going to act on the result. And multiple blood draws a day requires repeated wastage. Every time that you draw off an arterial line, you have to take the first couple mils of blood that are contaminated by saline that would be in the line, and typically that is discarded. 
There are, however, some benefits to, to standardized ordering. The intensive care is a really information dense environment and anything we can do to take cognitive burden off of staff uh, is something to be uh, considered carefully if we're going to, to take that away. Um, and it also reduces the risk of, of errors of omission. So uh, then what was our solution? And I think this is a really this slide is a really complicated way of saying we asked pay people to say exactly what blood tests they wanted every day and we integrated the opportunity to do that into our existing ward round structure so on monday morning the monday morning bloods are reviewed and the bloods for the bloods required for tuesday morning are, are specified in in the existing documentation and we've just added that tomorrow's blood section that you saw in the very first slide to our to our ward round review paperwork. That is then checked by the nurse, which is again standard practice uh, and then can be ordered for the for the following morning. And that really covers the reduction in lab testing uh, component of our, our blood conservation strategy. When it comes to volume reduction, uh, that's really all in the hands of our nursing staff. Uh, and we've focused a lot of education on encouraging them to reinfuse the, the waste blood that they that they take when they draw off an arterial line. And also to minimize the volume that they put in normal adult sized tubes. They don't require being filled up to the brim. Uh, it's perfectly safe to, to half fill them or even less in some cases. Uh, so letting them know that they can take less is, uh, is important. Right, so a little bit about the impact that we've had. Uh, it's only been a few weeks since the system was introduced, uh, so it's fairly sparing on the detail. Sorry about that. But here's a case study that demonstrates how this is supposed to be working. Now, the grey bars are fake and represent the, the standard orders that this patient might have had uh, under the old system, and the red bars show what was actually done. And you can see that they were admitted on the Sunday, and then through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they were quite unwell getting better towards Friday and Saturday, and the blood test that we ordered therefore reduced. Bit of a wobble on Sunday. Now, the other key bit of information to take from this graph is that we never really actually get to the 10 or 11 blood tests that we'd be doing every day, um, even, at, um, even when the patient's at their sickest. And this is because when we were designing the new paperwork, uh, we were looking critically at each blood test that formed part of our standard order, and we thought, Actually, there are three of these blood tests here that are replicated on the blood gases that we do multiple times a day. Uh, and they don't often, sending off an additional formal blood test doesn't often change our management. So we removed it from the standard order sort of tick boxes. Doctors can still specify them if they like, but no one has availed themselves of the opportunity yet. So we think we've, uh, we've had a, a good impact there straight off the bat. Righty-ho. I did a little bit of a spot audit, which is to say that I whipped around the unit and had a look at every daily review that had been done for every patient that was currently in, in the intensive care unit um, and, and had a look at what bloods they'd been ordered. And I split this into two groups. Firstly, the short stays of less than 10 days had about 85% of their potential orders asked for, which is to say those eight orders that form part of the tomorrow's bloods documentation. Uh, but for our longer stays, it was far less, about 55%. And this very much tracks with, um, you can you know, consider an, a typical intensive care admission, you'd be sickest towards the beginning, getting better as you, as you stay for longer. And while the number of patients there was only two long stays at the time that I, I did this audit, you'll note that they form the majority of the bed days in the unit. So we've actually made a fairly big reduction in the amount of blood that we've taken from, from these people. If you total that all up, it comes to about a 30% reduction if you just consider the eight orders that are available in, tomorrow, in tomorrow's bloods. If you add back in those three orders that I mentioned uh, just recently, then I've made a 53% reduction in the amount of, of blood tests that were ordered. And I, I would love to be able to leave it there and say, uh, you know, I've done a really great job here, look at that. Um, but unfortunately, there are a few caveats to, to speak of. The first being this might have just been an unusual week. It's a, it's a small amount of data at the moment, and we do need to be collecting more as we go on. Compliance, which is to say medical staff actually filling out the, the plans, was only about 50%. And I think this tracks with their knowledge that if they don't fill out that plan, then all of the blood tests are done as a, as a safety mechanism. 
Now, in most cases, that is always the appropriate thing to do. And I couldn't find any patient where they'd been getting decreasing amount of blood tests, had been getting better and better, and suddenly someone stops bothering to fill it out and they, they go back up to getting the full seven or eight blood tests a day. Also, some of the blood test reduction we saw in our long stay patients was specified as days per week. So, you know, please take blood three times per week for this patient. And that was our prior practice practice for, for our longer stay patients, but was applied haphazardly. Uh, we were slow to notice, you know, oh, actually, we don't need to be doing this many blood tests. But even in these cases, tomorrow's bloods documentation was used to, to specify exactly what blood tests were required. So there was some additional reduction from, from using the new system there. Unfortunately, my results won't perfectly align with the amount of volume reduction, uh, which is, you know, probably what actually matters to the rates of anemia in our unit uh, and how much blood we save, uh, simply because uh, if you order less, it doesn't necessarily mean you're taking less blood. As you can see in the top left there, uh, the yellow bottle has an outsized influence on the amount of orders that we that we take from it. And results don't always perfectly align to cost reduction either because of the complexity of processing large volumes of, of blood tests. It's very, very difficult for the for the local lab to give me a uh, pound value for each blood test. And I didn't see, I didn't do any work into blood gas volume simply because it was out of the scope of, of time I had to prepare today. What I will say though, is with the reduction of those three blood tests, we've completely removed the gray bottle or glucose from our standard ordering. So we've made a 25% reduction in the amount of blood we take from each patient. Uh, and those three those three orders that we've removed can be estimated to save us about thirty thousand pounds a year. Uh, so there is a there is an impressive number for me to to hang my hat on there right off the bat. Now, next steps are to continue educating our medical staff and our nursing staff that uh, we need to uh, keeping on with this and, and how it all works. We're a large body of staff uh, and we need to keep reminding everyone. Paperwork revisions, some have been suggested so far to make the system a little bit easier to work with, uh, and we're quite happy to do so and, and planning to in the, in the near future. And then finally, re-audit and collect some long-term data, particularly where we're going to need uh, large amounts of patients to see differences in things like transfusion data and our adjusted mortality. Finally, we need to compare our data with external institutions that have published data on their you know, blood tests related anemia uh, to see how we stack up. Uh, and that's all I had for you today. Thank you very much. And I think I now have an opportunity to take questions from you. We will now have a Q&A discussion. Why do your blood tests sometimes vary? The, the reason that uh, our blood tests vary, uh, you know, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight for our for our sickest patient is the impact of, of alternate day procalcitonin, which um, is I, I think 25 pounds uh, per per test is the is the lab what the lab quoted me for for just the reagent or the, just the immunoassay kit itself. Um, never mind the, the time required. Um, if we're, we're not stepping down from using procalcitonin so regularly, but it's something that I think has entered our practice relatively quickly because of the coronavirus pandemic and something that we as a unit are probably looking to, to scale back as less and less viral pneumonia hopefully comes into our unit. You can reinfuse blood. Yeah, because because of the way we take uh, because of the the point at which on an arterial line tubing that you that you take blood from, you've got a good two mils of of dead space in the tubing, which is saline, and then you've got to take a little bit more for for safety. So you're essentially taking a 50-50 mix of of saline and blood, which finds it awfully difficult to actually coagulate while it's in your tube. So it remains felt relatively safe to to reinfuse. Um, but it's it's only in that that particular context of intensive care with an arterial line that, that that's ever really useful. Do you think this intervention has capacity to be spread and scaled further across Wales? I think so. Um, I one of the one of the optional workshops that I attended was the was the adopt and spread or the boxing up your innovation um, adopt and spread light, if you like. Um, 
and I, I found that really interesting. And it's it's something that's sort of almost next on my tick list is to is to reach out locally within within Betsy. Uh, this is a project that I've presented at our sort of our North Wales forum for intensive care, uh, and we've had a chat to to sort of the the other units and their practice. And I think they they gave us the idea actually to you know oh why are you why are you still taking a formal glucose bottle every morning we just mm -hmm. do it on the gas what what are you doing here um, <laughs> I think the the feeling of this entire project has been well if an F two can think of it it's all pretty obvious stuff isn't it <laughs> um, so we, we got the idea there and, and we're we're going to keep talking to them about uh, you know potentially adapting and introducing some of our changes to paperwork and and practice and to into their practice as well.